Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the UKZ and Postgraduate Academy's first support group meeting for 2024. Um, I'm going through our participant list, and I see it's wonderful uh, to see familiar names, uh, recognize familiar faces, and to welcome newcomers to this community of postgrads, of mentors, of counselors, of truth tellers and cheerleaders, all of us invested in our own and also others' successes along this academic journey. Welcome. I mean, I, I love these sessions. These have been going on since 2020, if I'm not mistaken. These are meant to be very casual, very comfortable, very inspirational, constructive, open spaces for engagement on all, con uh, all as uh, content um, uh, directed to our development as well-rounded thought leaders. So during the course of the session, please feel free uh, within this casual space to pop your comments, pop your questions in the chat box. Please use your reaction icons, your emoticons liberally. We love those. Give a thumbs up, give a thumbs down. Um, hearts and fanfare, show it all, show your interest, show your engagement, your support, your participation within this community. Sorry. I seem to have lost my mouse, so I can't move. Okay, let me just speak. <laughs> so after all these words <laughs> and excitement, um, perhaps I should introduce myself. Let me do that. I am Prof. Uh, Leni Liebenberg. I am an honorary associate professor within UKZN School of Laboratory Medicine and uh, Medical Sciences. I'm a research associate at PRISA, and I hold a primary appointment as a chief researcher in immunology at CIRI, the Center for Epidemic Response and Innovation at Stellenbosch University. Wow. Go on. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Over the past few years, uh, I've hosted these support group meetings alongside the UKZN um, uh, College of Health Sciences support services team, as we share a common interest and passion for empowering our young people, our postgrads, our future leaders through awareness and practice of key aspects of professional development and well-being. And I see that uh, our SSS team is on here now, and perhaps now is a good time for us to have a brief uh, introduction, a little hello, a quick one, two, two seconds, as we kick off our very first Postgraduate Academy support group meeting. Thank you to the Student Support Services team for your contribution to the UKZN College of Health Sciences Postgraduate Academy's vision. Uh, would, would you like to unmute yourself for a quick hello? Thank you, Lenine. So greetings to the postgrad team. I think we're looking forward to walking with you on this journey together with our team in student support services. They're all on the screen for you to see. And along the year, I, I am so sure you will be engaging with either one or many of them as part of your postgrad journey. So welcome on board. We want to use this time as optimally as possible. So you'll get to know more about us, but we're going to revert Back to Lenine. Perhaps if the team could just have the videos on and say hi. We've got Christy, Suzanne, Willie. Okay, I don't see um, Nandi. Uh, okay. okay, so okay. hi everyone. I'm Willie Taver and I'm a student counselor. I'll chat to you all in a bit. You're okay. muted, Christy. Sorry. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Christy, and I'm a student counselor. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Suzanne, and I am also a student counselor, educational psychologist. See Nandi. Right. And in the absence of my colleague, Ms. Nandi Silin Chengase, she is a counseling psychologist. Thank you so much, So Thank you very much, team. I thought it was very important for us to see you up front um, while uh, in, in the beginning when I describe a little bit more about the Postgraduate Academy and what we do here. So the aim of the, um, uh, for the newcomers in particular, and as a reminder, 
the College of Health Sciences Postgraduate Academy. A postgraduate academy, excuse me. <laughs> it's a virtual center for postgraduate development and support. Um, we aim here to provide an environment that enhances your experience as a postgraduate candidate. Uh, so to do this, we focus on accessing, um, uh, providing access to resources for research skill and graduate attribute development and provide a supportive community of peers and mentors. So the structure of the Postgraduate Academy um, is, is such, we have some focused work group, workshops for areas such as statistics and academic writing and development. You would have received um, invitations to some of these during the course of the year and also regular information sessions, um, of which are available for later use on, and you'll find these on the UKZN YouTube website. Um, we also have within our webinar platform, um, I mentioned the technical development um, aspect, but also a large focus on holistic professional development, which we, uh, we, which we've been dub dubbing the support group meetings. And I just want to take a, a few steps back and describe how the Postgraduate Academy came about. Now, during lockdown uh, in 2020, we were working from home or trying our best to, and people were feeling isolated or uncertain and unmotivated. You know, I was, and, and my students were, I suppose, as well. And many of us ran the risk of not meeting our deadlines or our degree timelines, and it, it was worrisome. It was a tough time to, to be disconnected. Um, I was still considered as an early career researcher at the time and interested in research capacity development. I was looking for a mentor and I happened to meet Prof. Colleen Aldous. Uh, she invited me to participate in a wonderful initiative that she ran at the time uh, for her PhD students um, and her mentees, uh, where every week at a particular time, people would meet on Zoom as we did during uh, COVID lockdown with their coffees, their teas or whatever, and just sit there for an hour to discuss work or successes or troubles or what's going on in their lives. Or they'd be invited speakers um, that would be brought on to, uh, to speak to particular student needs. I mean, I recall I ran a session um, discussion on work-life study balance, which, uh, which I think was quite useful for everybody and me. Um, and that sort of setup for a student, as well as a supervisor and a mentor, I thought that sort of connection, a casual space for people to get together and still promote growth within each other, it was amazing. And together, we diversified the content and the meeting grew to become a more uh, structured academy, uh, as I showed you, where Prof. Aldous and I, along with the colleagues, Prof. Uh, Richard Heft, uh, Bushle, uh, Donda, and many others, along with the Student Support Services team, uh, we developed, uh, devoted our time to developing um, doctorateness and doctoral attributes, growing uh, technical skills and core skills and an awareness of well-being that defines a successful graduate, which we all want to be or aspiring to be. And we realize that this content is not only relevant to PhD students, but also to postgrads who are interested in succeeding in their academic journey and beyond. Uh, so that is the origin story of the Postgraduate Academy. I spoke a little bit about doctoral attribute, attributes, and I, th I thought it might be worthwhile to just spend two minutes um, touching on that a little bit more within this um, session. Um, so in 2018, South Africa's Council for Higher Education, CHE, released its qualification standard for doctoral uh, degrees. And these uh, standards prescribe a set of nine attributes that the graduates um, you must master as a PhD student to meet the degree requirements. And we thought that the academy would be a great space for uh, awareness about these um, to students and also to supervisors um, and for all doctoral candidates to ensure that they keep these attributes in mind and consider how they'll develop these through their doctoral journey. Um, and of course, 
this awareness and the related mindset would benefit, you know, the honor, honor students who are part of this journey or master students, which is why we migrated um, from doctoral to more general postgraduate academy. Right. So uh, we do have a website. Uh, there's a little QR code over there, and you are able to access information about um, short courses, um, what webinars were available, um, but also, oh, sorry, a YouTube web, uh, YouTube um, uh, Postgraduate Academy also has a, a section in the UKZN YouTube website. And if you go to the website, you would also be able to see our previous sessions. Um, I hope you can are able to see this on the screen. And I've left the QR code on the screen as well for you. But today's specific, uh, our meeting today, our support group meetings, as I mentioned, falls in this um, uh, uh, the, the holistic professional development structure within the Postgraduate Academy. And here we focus on promoting core skill development and well-being for graduate success. And during these meetings, you'll be hearing things that, um, as I mentioned, are important in developing ourselves during our postgraduate professional journey, like learning about effective communication, um, the benefits of networking, how to optimize it, how to use emotional intelligence to get your message uh, across, um, how to manage criticism better, uh, the benefits of resilience, how to get that, how to adopt a, a growth mindset, um, a focus on career planning, uh, managing your time appropriately, branding yourself, branding your research, branding your work, uh, managing professional relationships, which is the topic of today's session, um, discussions about stress and burnout, work-life study balance, uh, managing harassment, the imposter phenomenon and mental health. All of these are key aspects. We are going to be experiencing um, some of these during our journeys and some of these skills are required to manage more effectively. And these are topics of discussion that we will be exploring within uh, the support group meetings going forward. Um, I mentioned that these have happened uh, since 2020, and uh, we do in initially and at the end have a survey about you know what students would like, and you'll hear more about that from the student support services team. But I thought it was useful to just show you some um, output of our previous sessions. Um, all bars in green are yes, we strongly agree. And uh, you'll see a lot of green, and these are more positive um, statements. Yes, um, my learning experience was enhanced. Yes, the facilitators were responsive. Yes, we were effective. Yes, the content was clear. Yes, the resources were helpful. Yes, the content was re uh, relevant. Yes, this was a valuable experience attending the postgraduate support group meetings. Would you recommend it to others? Yes. Um, were my skills improved? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so it seems to be a, a benefit to uh, students, postgraduates attending these sessions, and we are very, very happy uh, to be doing our part. Um, so over the next couple of months, we'll be hosting these sessions once a month uh, for an hour uh, to up an hour and a half. Um, Generally, the, the first uh, Thursday of the month, uh, with an exception or two now and again, uh, and we will be discussing the content that I mentioned in the previous slides. So just to, to end up before I hand over to the SSS team, a reminder of the structure of these sessions, they are monthly. Um, hosted by the Student Support Services team, um, CHS Academic Faculty, and invited guests. Again, these are informal sessions, they're interactive sessions, they're conducted in a supportive environment. We all want to succeed here. Nobody's here to judge anybody and put them down. We want to grow. We want to grow together. Uh, this 
platform is meant to promote success in degree and career paths by bringing together a supportive, see that keyword, supportive, go people, go us, supportive community of peers, of supervisors and role models, all eager to share, to learn and to grow together. So thank you for being part of this community by being here today. If you have any questions about what I've spoken about before, you're welcome to contact me. Um, the emails and contact numbers are on the screen at the moment. Um, and I'm going to end off there. And uh, if, if anybody has any questions, um, please raise your hand or pop it in the chat and we can address it. Otherwise, I'll be moving on to the student support services team to explain a little bit more about what they do. So, so I don't see any mm -hmm. comments in the chat. Can anybody else see? So if no. not, if I, if I could just be allowed to share. Let's see, are you? Yes, there we go. Okay. Can we see that? Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. My video on. Thank you so much, Lenine. And I love the fact that you're holding on the support. It's all about support, active learning, being there for each other, people you could lean on. So it's that kind of flourishing environment. Um, so so I'm 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 gonna take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit about what student support services is all about. And I think if you've been at any higher education university space you would have heard about student support services. Sometimes it's called um, student counseling, careers and development. It's called student development at UKZN because we're using a college model and we devolve to colleges. They call it professional services, uh, which encompasses the holistic student wellness and development. So you, you, being at university, you would have known that getting to where you are in postgraduate, you didn't come this journey alone. You walked with a couple of people along the way, supported by family, friends, peers, partners, other students, your academics. So many, many people joined you on the journey. And what we know about success is that it does not happen by chance and nor does it happen alone. So you as a student are most important in this journey but you need to take along with you many, many, many role players to get you to your destination. Now, what we do know uh, in higher education within this landscape are we have diverse students, diverse student needs, and complex personal histories. So we know that no single strategy or no single intervention applies to all. We do, do need to have a tailored strategy to reflect both the institutional characteristics as well as the student characteristics. And, and, and when we have a, a targeted intervention program, it's actually based on us knowing our students, getting to know them better, and designing strategies and support interventions that are more meaningful, relevant, and responsive. So in the College of Health Sciences Student Support Services, we have just that. We have a structured, integrated, collaborative, success strategy from undergrad to postgrad. We also are very mindful of the personal challenges that impact a student's well-being as well as academic success. So beyond tracking academic progression and grades and marks, we look at what are those factors outside the lecture room, outside the lab space that impacts our students' wellness and has a ripple effect of impacting their performance. So we are in place to support students with the constructive help to navigate the study journey and remain well at the same time. Our student support services is established in higher education by virtue of the Higher Education Act. And we have three broad roles to play. One being to support and enhance wellness, support holistic growth and development of the students. Of course, to limit premature dropout and failure, in particular at the undergraduate level and to provide guidance, counseling, and uh, therapy. And that's, of course, on the slide, as you can see, how do we do this? 
we get to know you more about you um you know your characteristics your needs your aspirations your dreams and by knowing you we're able to develop these targeted strategies to support you we also prioritize your personal needs as students try to create an enabling environment, support you with the outside the lecture room support. Uh, and much of what's happening in the classroom is not necessarily what impacts a student's success. It's a lot more what's going on outside. So the Postgrad Academy um, is actually geared towards doing just that, providing you with the necessary extracurricular support to support your postgrad journey. So uh, as, as a postgrad student, you are central to your success. This is your journey. This is your goal. This is your objective. So you also need to prioritize your wellness as a first step to ensuring your academic success. And that's because we know that if you're not well, you can't be productive. When you're not productive, when you underperform, you can't be motivated. And then it, that affects your persistence, your determination, impacts goal achievement. So much is affected when you are not well. So we, we see that being a student is a holistic experience and there's sufficient documented literature to confirm that there is a very strong link between student wellness and student success. And that is where student support services comes in. The slide essentially illustrates to you the layers of support and intervention that's offered by us as student support services. And for postgrads, it commences with the postgrad academic orientation through to the wellness assessment, profiling and monitoring. And you will hear more about these processes as we progress beyond today. Um, I think it's only after this session that we take you to the next level of um, supporting your wellness. But what I've presented to you are the layers of support that's available, targeted processes to engage with you, some of the skills development that's also uh, available beyond the support. We are able to tap into critical issues that impact student wellness and success that's often not visible to many uh, because the team in student support has the competency to probe deeper in, in therapy sessions, perhaps if it's individual therapy or group sessions if they're involved in group activities with our postgrads. And once again, uh, literature documents that the majority of factors impacting student success are actually occurring outside the lecture room. Um, so if you look at what I have on the slide, an iceberg, and, you know, uh, the tip of the iceberg is what is visible to the eye. But what goes on beneath, one would never really know. And what goes on in the lecture room is just 20% of what the academies can see or the research supervisor can see. And that's by tracking academic progression. But what is really impacting that student is actually beneath the surface. It's not necessarily always visible or known. And it's only through a process of inquiry, uh, through a process of probing that one gets to know better what is really going on and how can we better support the student to progress with their academics. So over the years, we have noted key trends uh, with both our undergrad and postgraduate students. Some of the common issues that they present with is relationship issues, be it uh, personal relationships, boy, girl, or partner relationships, colleague relationships, uh, peer relationships, and relationship issues with the supervisor, with the research supervisor. So, so those relationship issues play, play out in academic progression. Further to that is family issues. And particularly what stood out during COVID was mental health issues. And there was a tendency to downplay or to underreport. But I think if anything, COVID has foregrounded and highlighted the significance of uh, mental health issues. And in particular, the prevalence of mental health and its impact on university students. Um, so grief and bereavement is the other that we pick up as a common trend. Um, and, and as you progress to becoming more senior in your studies, um, sometimes it's underplayed that you actually need to pay attention to deal with the losses that you experience in your life. Substance abuse is often used as a coping strategy um, and is underreported at university. Adjustment to the postgrad program, adjustment to a new uh, supervisor style. Um, identity issues, loneliness, academic performance, and of course, being very confused about where you go to as a next step once you've got this degree. So that's generally what we pick up with university students. 
But with post-grad students, we did a study over many years just to look at what are their experiences, what are their challenges, and what are the key trends that we pick up with post-grad students. And we did this via the wellness uh, assessment and the wellness profiling. And what we found, there was a key pattern that came up was transitional challenges. Transitioning from undergrad to postgrad and in independent study with postgrad, moving from one university to another, anxieties around independent study, sustaining one's motivation in the postgrad process, managing multiple roles. Um, they're not traditional students, so often uh, postgraduates are managing families, um, relationships, children, parents. There's multiple responsibilities and pressures on a postgraduate student. Integration to the university is a further concern, especially if you come from another university. Again, isolation and loneliness, funding, accommodation, and language barriers, and that we found to be common amongst our students that are international students. We did, during the lockdown, look at the impact of the pandemic, and there was important learning experiences for us on what exactly is going on with our students and why there was such uh, presentations during the lockdown, um, and it became evident that more, more than just about connectivity, device, etc., but also the isolation from peers and colleagues. Now, at Student Support, we offer you free, confidential, professional, blended counseling services. We offer it as face to face as well as virtually via Zoom, or if you want to chat via WhatsApp to a student counselor. And the key services include personal counseling, career assessment, wellness support, academic support, a retention strategy, crisis and trauma management, skills development, wellness mentoring. And of course, for our undergrads, we have the first year experience modules. We have disability support for all levels of study and residence living and learning program. Although it's targeted primary, par primarily at first year, I mean, at undergrads, there are many postgrads that join the Living and Learning program as well. So our services during the lockdown continued. We, we learned to offer blended services with excellent learning. We made ourselves more available to students and there's a wider reach with a virtual as well as contact sessions. We do more webinars and group sessions like we are doing today. And of course, our, our Moodle module offers additional mental health and life skills development resources. I'm not going to touch on career development as this will come up as a later talking point in subsequent sessions, but I would like to tap on students with impairment. And I think this is very important because during COVID, there was a strong focus on the mental well-being of our students and how they were coping with the isolation associated with lockdown. Now, within the college, our students register with statutory councils such as the HBCSA, SANC, South African Pharmacy Council, and they all set down rules and guidelines for professional conduct, as well as to ensure fitness to practice. Healthcare practitioners are subject to all sorts of key legislation, be it the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Mental Health Care Act, the National Health Act, etc. So these are significant for healthcare practitioners, and it informs our protocol at the College on Student Impairment. So we have established a process to manage to timelessly identify and to manage promptly and with dignity students who present with mental uh, with mental health issues. And this includes support, counseling, referral, as well as it's sometimes the duty to report if, if a healthcare practitioner or a student in training remains impaired. And I think that's, that's, that's ensuring that we have a student that's well uh, and we do not unleash a student that's unwell into the clinical setting. So student support uh, has in place psychologists, clinical social workers. We have the HIV AIDS program that's centrally based. We have campus health services that's currently based in the College of Health Sciences. We have disability services as well as occupational health services. So, you know, this program, this postgrad academy is actually going to allow us to get to know you better. And it's only when we understand from your perspective, what the issues are, are we able to better intervene and provide you with relevant, responsive, and meaningful programs? Our intent is to provide you with ongoing social and academic support, to equip our postgraduate with skills to cope with the diverse expectations of higher education, 
as well as the demands of postgrad studies and to help you to track your performance so that we, we can identify where the gaps are and intervene with the necessary support. So uh, the, the program that's going to unfold over the months is what will be in place to support you. Importantly, um, any improvement in student learning is not just the effort of an individual or one program, but it really requires a structured, a coherent action by all involved in the student's life. And that's all of us, or, or all of the people at the university, the key role players are part of your journey. And this, at the beginning, I said, you need to help them join you on this journey. Access, uptake is very important if you want to ensure student success and student well-being. So you are going to meet the team and they will tell you more about where to find them, where we are based. We are on all campuses of the university, where there's a health science program being offered, as well as in the GCTP and rural site. So we've got student support services there as well. So colleagues, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to my team um, and, and they will take you through um, further content regarding today's program. Thank you so much. And I look forward to a shared journey with you this year. Thank you. No problem, it's fine. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pele, for that. And I'm going to pick up from, from uh, where Dr. Pele has left off. And I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Okay, so. So greetings, colleagues. Um, I, okay, so you can you can all see my screen. Yes, we can. Lovely. So greetings again, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Willie Favor, and a student counselor, and it is an absolute pleasure to share this platform with you all today. Suzanne and I will share with you brief tips. We will build on what Dr. Pillay started. Brief tips to better support you through the postgrad journey. There will also be a link. Uh, towards the latter part of my presentation that will uh, take you through to a needs assessment survey that will guide us into learning more about your current needs so that we can critically engage with you in order to better support you. Also, like Lenin said earlier, your active participation will be appreciated and, and please feel free to pop in a question into the chat space or raise your hand if there's something that you wish to share with us. Um, at the end of Suzanne's presentation, we have a surprise guest for you, and uh, it was going to take us through the topic of supervisor relationship, academic harassment, bullying, and uh, handling academic criticism. And that is none other than Dr. Jafter, who is the academic leader of research in the School of Nursing and Public Health. And I'm sure that's going to be an exciting session that you're going to be waiting to hear. So welcome, Dr. Jafta, uh, to this platform, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you in a short while. So just, just a few questions that will help us to get to know you briefly. It's, we, you've got to meet the team a little bit. Uh, you're going to meet us by the end of the session. You'd have met all of us. But I'd like, we, we would like to get to know who we have with us. And if perhaps you could just give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, if the, quest, the answer to your, the questions are yes or no, you are also free to unmute or place your responses on the chat space. This is just for us to get a sense of who's in this room today with us. So my first question to you is, are any of you here registered for the first time this year in a postgraduate program? So I can yes. see the thumbs up and thumbs down. And uh, so my colleagues can help me by just checking who we have here. But yeah, I already heard a yes. So some of us are here for the first time. Okay, so I'll leave the chat space to my to my team, right? And I can see some hands up. Yeah, so there's How a couple of yeses and no's, a really good balance. Great. So, so the, my second question then is, are you a returning student?
Nanbir, I see you have your, your hand up. Oh, okay. You're not a returning student. Okay. <laughs> oh, you okay, are. So there's lots of stuff in the chat space. So, so yes. you, 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 yeah, my team will just pick up on that. Um, my next question to you is you were last, were you last a student more than five years ago? And if you want to share with us on the chat space, when last you were a student, you're welcome to. So yes and a no, a yes. So it seems like it's a good mix as well. So yes, last 2013, 2010. Wow, wonderful responses. Thank you. Are you in full-time employment? So quite a couple have said affirmatively yes. So this, this the next question is going to be then, I wonder, how, how many of you juggle multiple roles? Or how many of you are just here as a student, full-time student? Uh, thumbs multiple up. Roles? Great. Perfect, yes. I feel like a clown juggling away. I can imagine. My next question is who on our who on this meeting today lives outside of KwaZulu Natal? Well, Durban firstly, KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, anybody living far and wide away from the vicinity of UKZN? Yeah, so we've a few outside of KZN and South Africa. Oh, wow. Someone's in Ghana. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Gauteng. Lesotho. Thank you so for this sharing. Helped, yeah, and it help, really helps us to get to know who our students are and where you're from. And, and my next question is, have you heard of student support services? Prior to today. Okay, so some have said yes and no, some from orientation last year, for only today, no, so that's a good mix. Okay, and for those of them who've said yes, oh, have you accessed student support services prior to this? A couple of no's and a couple of yeses. Okay. And then my last question to you, oh, well, I, I would like for you to maybe describe in a word or a phrase your feelings thus far. How are you feeling, not just today, but probably since the start of the program, uh, your start of the, the post-grad journey, anything that you would like to share, a word, a phrase, Anxious about research, busy, overwhelmed, progressively steadily, exhausted and overwhelmed, exhausted, can't wait for the program to be finished next year, overwhelmed, drained, very powerful words. Really powerful. So, uh, so that, thank you so much for, for participating and for sharing. And I think in a sense, it really gives us the team here uh, an idea of whom we are engaging with today. And, and it really, really allows us to see that we certainly uh, are connecting with you in a space that we know is going to be beneficial to you. So Dr. Pillay has already placed into context the need for structured student support initiatives. Since we know that student success does not just happen by chance, so we in SSS have designed intentional, structured and integrated uh, support strategies to allow you to navigate this postgraduate journey uh, as best as you can and, and with success. So we do know that success is not what people think it looks like. And we do know from the words that you've shared now that this is pretty much 
what many of you are feeling right now. So whether you are starting out on this post grad journey, whether you are wrap, wrapping it up, whether you are somewhere in between, the historical challenges that we have faced in the last five years has certainly changed our lives in numerous ways. And, and what does this mean for you as a student? For us as student support services, we needed to get our feet on the ground as quickly as possible and figure out what all of this meant for our students and how to best support you. And therefore we've conducted, like Dr. Pillay said, several surveys, needs assessments, evaluations, and we aimed to understand our students, their emotions, their feelings, and their experiences. And, and, and what, lots of what was already shared prior to this is what we have learned are the challenges of our postgrad students. So this brings me to a very important uh, aspect, which is, called, which is known as a progression of our postgraduate students. A very important policy that must be noted is the academic monitoring and support policy, which actively, which was actively implemented by our postgrad students since January of 2024. And this was to monitor the progression of our students. So you would have learned by now that there are general rules in terms of academic exclusion, as well as exclusion with a right to appeal. So in January this year, many postgrad students who failed to progress within the maximum time were expected to meet certain requirements. You were expected to consult with your academic leader of research. You, you, could, you were expected to motivate, to reapply, to return to the program. And many, many students that we had engaged with were on the last lap of a research, were just about to submit, et cetera, but had to then appeal to re-enter the program. So therefore, I needed to just share with you at this platform and build on from knowing your challenges, knowing that there are reasons why our students underperform and it has led to students being in this position where they needed to then apply to re-register into this program. The reality of this being that despite the various challenges postgrad students experience, you are expected to progress within the required timeframes in order to be declared degree complete. So, okay. So this brings me to the critical need for timeless identification of challenges and timeless intervention and support, which was already shared with you in terms of some of the strategies that we, we focus on. And the Student Wellness and Academic Transformation Program is an annual program that we implement with all our postgrad students. You will soon, shortly after this session, be receiving a link to a wellness assessment, which is based on the wellness model that will help us to timelessly understand your needs, your experiences, your challenges. And this will enable us to offer you timeless intervention and support, and thereafter offer you ongoing uh, monitoring and support. Now that we are aware of the strategies of support in place, let us take a look at tips to guide you through the postgraduate journey. I often ask uh, my postgrad students, sometimes in orientation and whenever we do get to in engage with you, who are you as a postgraduate student? What makes you different? And what would you say are your unique needs? So we know that a postgraduate student is a student who has successfully completed an undergraduate degree and is undertaking further study at an advanced level. However, we also know that a postgraduate student's needs are very different when undergraduate by the very virtue of your established roles and responsibilities. Somebody mentioned about feeling like a clown flitting in between the multiple roles that you play. So it is really highly unlikely that you are solely a student. Which is why I love this quotation from a postgraduate student. And, and the quote says, and the student says, besides my studies, so many other things need my attention. I can't just every time say that I am studying, but I can't do the other things. I have a family life and all of the other things and a social life, so my whole life can't just revolve around the studies. 
So I give to each part of my life that what I think is good enough. So let's drill a little deeper on what's expected of you as you juggle your multiple roles and to achieve success as a postgraduate student. So I'm sure through this postgraduate academy, many of the aspects that I'm just going to touch on will be talked about in great detail. So I share briefly a few aspects that are deemed critical from the very beginning of a postgraduate student's journey. So the relationship between a postgraduate student and his or her supervisor is unique and it's critical. It demands concerted effort and sacrifice on both of the parties. Dr. Jafta will, will, will shortly expand on this in, 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 in much greater detail. But important to note is how and why do you choose a particular supervisor? What can you reasonably expect from your supervisor? And what should you expect to give in return? What happens if this relationship breaks down? So the ideal supervisor will be one that is experienced in your field of study, interested in your topic, empathetic, and able to offer appropriate support and guidance. Make an appointment with your supervisor to discuss your ideas. Try to create a good impression. So for example, when you go into a session with your supervisor, be prepared with a mind map of your topic or a timeline on your progress or take along readings that you think are appropriate. Secondly, an important aspect for, uh, for postgrads is on needing to know and finding out. Students tend to function on a need to know basis. In other words, when you need to know something, then you will find out about it. There are two problems, of course, with the strategy. Firstly, we seldom know that there is something that we do not know. And secondly, we find that by the time we needed to know something, it has become really urgent. So take time, students, to, to figure out all the resources that you are going to need uh, and, and where to, who, whom to speak to and how to access these resources before it becomes an emergency. And thirdly, giving to each part of your life. As an adult learner, we have many de demands upon us and all seem to be the most important. Develop an attitude of giving to each aspect what is good enough. There is a nice balance here. Sometimes you involve family to assume more responsibility so that you can finish the chapter for your supervisor. And at another time, the chapter will have to wait when your family needs you. So be realistic about how much time you will be able to spend on your thesis or your studies. Consider work and family demands. Set realistic deadlines for completing this degree. Would your supervisor set realistic short-term and, and medium-term deadlines? Try to meet them, but not at the cost of your own health and sanity or that of your families. Don't wait for the right time before you begin to start working. Successful studying is like eating an elephant a mouthful at a time. Huge blocks of free time are unlikely to happen. The secret is to work systematically for short periods and, and, and when, you, when you can, when you have the short periods, work systematically for the short periods. And when you don't, because when you don't work regularly, you will find that all your energy goes into just getting back and getting started instead of being productive through ongoing consistent work. Sometimes just taking a break can really help re-inspire you. Go away, read a little uh, a frivolous book or page through a magazine. This might just energize you so that you'll be able to better focus and better concentrate on your research. Some other pointers that we like to share is when you plan a journey, you usually ask a friend or a family who is familiar with the route to just give you some tips in terms of finding your way around. So think of your study program as 
a journey with your graduation as the enchanting destination. And these tips that I'm going to share with you are from students who have walked this path before you. And this is what they found worthwhile. Firstly, organize a quiet private space to work. The dining room table won't do it. It may become a hassle to unpack before working or to pack away again after writing that it can actually become an excuse to not begin at all. A study, of course, is ideal, but it's not a privilege that is available to all of us. So a tip would be to try screening off a section of your bedroom, your living room, or a shared working space. This is your work in progress area, a place that you can go to and your work will be as it was when you last left it. Here you should feel free to leave papers, and piles of books lying around on the floor, around your table, and sticky notes to, your, to yourself on the wall. It can be an organized chaos space. Plan good lighting for this area, because poor lighting is certainly going to make you sleepy and reluctant to work. Secondly, read the thesis of people who have written in your field. This is invaluable, as you will now learn how researchers have arranged their argument and addressed a tricky situation or a tricky issue or wrote with an academic voice. A third tip, tape the feedback sessions with your supervisor. Transcribe them for yourself. This will help clarify your thinking about whatever aspects of the research projects you are discussing. These transcripts are useful because you can refer back to them later when you want to revisit a point that your supervisor or even you made during the session. It is also useful because your supervisor models appropriate discourse for your topic. Listening to your supervisor and your supervision sessions will help you to understand and to use language that is appropriate to your field of study. Fourthly, take clear notes of everything. Put the full bibliography details at the top of any notes that you take. Begin your bibliography straight away with the first book that you read. Set it out correctly from the beginning. Copying quotations must be done carefully. You do not want to have to worry later on about whether they are correct or, or, or the, the source from which you've extracted it. Be particularly careful of the differences between the American spelling and the British spell, uh, English spelling. And sometimes the computer's autocorrect. Make a note of the author's gender. You will need this information when you are presenting his or her argument. A suggestion is to stick an outline of your section of your thesis on the wall at your workstation. This will help you to stay focused and gives you a sense of progress. Any relevant ideas can be written onto this outline so that they are not forgotten. When you work, and a very important point, when you work on your computer, save your documents regularly. By that, I mean at least three times a day on both your hard drive and on other devices. And to add, even keep them in different spaces so you know that they will be safe. In this way, if anything goes wrong, you have not lost too much of your hard work. Also, a very important point is to date each section of your work that you are writing so that you, so that you will be sure which draft is your most up-to-date version. So these are very critical tips that I try to share with you uh, in terms of helping you be well during this academic process. Suzanne is also gonna add a few strategies and techniques to add to your already growing, achieving academic success toolbox. So you already have some critical tools in there and we're gonna add to that. So these tips that I shared with you are written by a previous postgrad student, Dr. McMillan, who was a postgraduate herself and struggled to stay motivated. And we all know that this can be a long and a lonely journey. You may want to give up often, yet you want to stay in the program for many reasons, including maybe being funded. To keep going, ensure that, you're, that, you, can, you, that you liaise with other postgrad students, you form a community for yourself within this program. And this is 
actually a community that can support you the most that academy. Have conversations with your family and your friends for the support that you think they can offer you. And just remember that as difficult as this may seem right now, this is doable. Many, many students before you have succeeded. The support is always available, whether it is personal, academic, or health related. The team of academics and support services are available and willing to assist you. You just need to reach out to us timelessly, and we will be able to offer you the support that you require. Together, we are all one team, and we have one intention, and that is to help you achieve your academic goals and thrive in the process. So all we want to say is that you need to be proactive. You know yourself better than anybody else. And if you find that something is not the way it should be, do not wait to seek services and support on the last minute. Because when we intervene on the last minute, we are only addressing a crisis. Intervention is limited. Be proactive and reach out to us the moment you feel that something needs to be addressed. So to help us understand your immediate needs, please take uh, a few minutes to complete the needs assessment, but I'm going to put that onto, this, onto the chat space in a short while. I've tried to join the dots for you, connect the pieces, ignite hope in your journey. Suzanne will take us through a few critical strategies, just a few to help you align your well-being and your academic progress. Thank you. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Wooly. I see that my screen is active. Um, I do know that my um, connection is a little wonky, so there will be a moment where I will be switching off my video, but just to get, let you guys know, this is going to be a very jam-packed, interactive kind of little snippet in our, in our presentation. So it would be really great that if you are, would like to share and engage that you feel free to do so on the chat space. I do have the chat space kind of open on my on my screen. So if there is any uh, questions or comments or your own tips that you would like to share, please do so on the chat space. Um, so yeah, um, I think it is so important just to acknowledge that we're all feeling somewhat overwhelmed and exhausted, drained, anxious, but also determined and motivated. So that is uh, encouraging knowing that you're feeling this way at this time of the year. And I think what we want to tap into is what are you doing that is helping you to cope well or at least maintain um, some type of, uh, you know, equilibrium when it comes to managing your life and um, academic stresses. And we have seen in the past that these life um, challenges, university, family, uh, work life, um, even just managing your own downtime can be quite challenging. So uh, I think it's just um, you know important to say that we may even be exposed to considerable high levels of stress from these spaces, the academics, the social, familial, financial, and emotional pressures. So do share with us, how are you doing that? How are you managing life? Um, share with us in the chat space, how are you, uh, you know, what, what strategies are you implementing that speaks to healthier coping um, mechanisms? We've seen that and we've noticed life around us has changed and we tend to see ourselves experiencing greater expectations to be well, to do well and be ready for what life brings. So for some, it might be easy to adapt and evolve and for others, it might not be so easy. So as we share our strategies, someone might learn something new or be encouraged to continue doing something that they may believe is not working or not helping. But essentially, we need to manipulate us, our time, ourselves, people around us, our schedules. And at times we may even end up compromising or losing some things in life, uh, but it shouldn't be this way. So let's look at some of these coping strategies. So what are you currently doing? What's working for you? What would you regard as a good enough coping strategy for right now? So do share with us or indicate which ones you are engaging in. It can be just a word, a phrase, or something. And I am mindful of time. 
So while I wait for your responses, I'm just going to share some ideas. Maybe some of these are things that you're currently doing. Yeah. Are you managing your sleep? Are you mindful? Are you implementing good sleep hygiene practices? Oh, well done. Keep sharing your suggestions and ideas. And I think essentially as you're sharing, answer the question or identify what will work for you. Uh, whether it's writing down three things each day, uh, utilizing apps, and whatever works for you, you might find that it will help you to stay motivated, uh, motivated to keep doing the difficult things or um, helps you to create space for the fun things in life. It prevents procrastination. Going home for a few days, every time I feel like I'm having a breakdown, I come back refreshed, connecting with your friends and family, meditation, growing sp spiritually, reading the Bible, talking to close friends, setting realistic goals and forgiving yourself if you have to amend or reprioritize. And I love what, what coping strategies you guys are sharing with us. And it's exactly that. Your coping strategy is a list of activities and processes you do to maintain your wellness. And it is part of your daily routine. And that's exactly one of the things I want to touch on is what are you integrating into your routine to help you maintain this balance? And if not, that's okay. Let's figure it out today together. What is routine? And how can routine benefit you? So routine assists you in managing those stresses of life, and especially the uncertainty within our daily lives. Stresses are dynamic and varying in intensity. And we find that with the lack of routine and balance, we may become overwhelmed. We present in distress, be unproductive, um, as it may impact your ability to complete tasks or transition from the one task to the next and further impact your ability to implement those healthy coping strategies. So routine encourages one to have a say over what we hope to have in our lives and what we want to experience. So start finding time for yourself, finding pockets of time that you can devote to yourself. Since everything in your life has had your attention throughout the day, so that's so important. You now get to be your own focus of attention. So yeah, we can see that the benefits and gains are far and wide. Um, when one doesn't have a routine or structure to, the, to their day, as I've mentioned, it can cause an increase in stress and anxiety, along with those other overwhelming feelings and impair our ability to move from one task to the next. So find what works for you in establishing a routine and don't underestimate the power of a break. Okay, so ensure that you add this to your routine. I don't know how many of you are compromising on your mini breaks, whether it's a tea or, or a lunch, um, but regular breaks are needed for that, for the brain to regain its focus and for the body to revitalize and re-energize. So say me in the chat space, if you have taken a break today, let's see how many me's we've got out, out there. If it's not me, just say no. Nope. Uh, let's see how many of us have taken a break today. Some of the ideas of things you could do in, in your break. Um, I do apologize. I got a little excited there. I saw a post on the chat space. Oh my goodness, two me's. Well done, guys. What you can do in your breaks, engage in mindfulness meditation. This is one of the other coping strategies you can engage in. Um, and you'll notice as you practice, you'll find it easier uh, to do uh, so be patient and be consistent. Uh, mindfulness meditation, uh, when you're doing this, you're engaging in a process of focused breathing, and it is a tool to help ground yourself and be present in the moment. Mindfulness is one method to reducing stress and preventing burnout. So this will definitely help you in managing those feelings of being overwhelmed. So if you haven't taken a break after the session, Go and take the, that 10 minutes and so that you can say me. So deal with those stressful situations consciously and wisely. This will help you to prevent burnout, which mindfulness can, can kind of help you with this. 
So some mindful activities you can engage in is a bre like breathing can help prevent inner judgment and offer that rational part of our brain the opportunity to be present and adjust to the many daily life experiences and even find creative solutions to some of our challenges. Um, so instead of, uh, yeah, during mindfulness, you might find yourself, your mind will wander. So instead of struggling against um, your thoughts, just simply notice them without judgment. Acknowledge them when once your mind has wandered and then return your attention back to the mindfulness activity. So we do find that um, distractibility does creep in when you're new in, in, in your activities of mindfulness and meditation. So just to be conscious of time, um, I don't know how many of you are engaging in mindfulness or meditation or um, gratitude writing or journaling or any activity that you kind of find yourself grounded. Um, you'll notice that you start noticing and becoming aware of the beauty around you, the company you ha are with how you respond to situations and how you show kindness to yourself and others. So as part of your routine, ensure that you set daily time to engage in mindful practice. Um, it, 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 the benefits you will notice, um, you will be in a state of calm, inner peace, and even notice that you'll be kinder to yourself and improve or increase an inner belief and hope within yourself. So my, my, Last um, strategy here is focusing on social engagement. Um, so wh whatever it may be, explore what it means to cope and manage with life and studying and establish those few good rules to live by. And set them up, listen to yourself and make the de best decision for yourself. Social engagement is vital, such as connecting with the community, family, friends, study partners, or even just engaging in cultural activities. These are ways to stimulate your brain activity, keeping you involved, develop a sense of belonging and purpose. And people who stay socially involved are thought to be, be to do better with, um, with the life stresses. So there are many benefits to engaging on a social level. There is the academic success and you achieve this by engaging with peers and mentors and support. And you may even enhance your understanding of complex topics and provide diverse perspectives when engaging in these conversations. Emotional support. We know that postgraduate studies can be quite stressful and isolating. So social interactions can help in building a support network that can offer emotional support, reduce feelings of isolation and stress. And if you're part of a study group or a social group outside of your studies, share with us what groups you are involved in, whether it is a reading book, uh, book club or a knitting group or a gym group or running group, share with us the groups you are involved in. Other groups that you can maybe consider as part of your studies is professional development groups. Networking with other students, or researchers or academics can also open up opportunities for further collaboration, conferences and career and developing career skills. The skills that you may develop will um, not only just be for um, learning how to participate in group activities, but those essential skills such as communication, teamwork and leadership. And one last um, benefit in engaging in social activities and, um, and that would be creating or establishing um, and uh, um, rather, um, let me just say, you're gaining a strong sense of belonging and connectedness with peers. Uh, this can lead to higher engagement and feeling more motivated, which is critical um, for completing further studies. So whatever you're doing, allow those activities in terms of your coping strategies to add to um, a healthy lifestyle. Um, good lifestyle is more likely possible when you have a good, solid support system of friends and family and can help you carve out time for those recreation and hobbies. It helps uh, such as spending time in nature, practice spirituality, and have someone we trust to talk to. Um, about our problems. Um, so in summary, taking this integrated approach to health and wellness means paying attention to how 
daily habits and overall lifestyle can have an important effect on you as an individual and all that um, the different roles that you're playing. Um, so it is more now than ever important to be aware of those activities that replenish, that revitalize uh, and re-energize you. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for listening and I wish you all of the best. Do share with us some of your strategies that you have, um, that I haven't touched on, but would be good to share with everybody else. So back to you. Thank you so much, Sue. Yes, please do, uh, everybody in the chat, uh, place your comments, any tips uh, for what you do. I love the mindfulness. Thank you so much for mentioning that. I keep forgetting and I thank you. Whenever I see you, I need to mind myself. I need to get back into that. Um, but now we're going to switch track a little bit uh, to speak about is one of the, the, the triggers, the stresses um, that many students tend to, um, tend to experience, this relationship between uh, the student and the supervisor. I know Willie touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, and Willie also mentioned a very, very special guest, surprise guest that we have on our seminar today, uh, Dr. Nkosana Jafter, who is the academic lead of research at the School of Nursing and Public Health at UKZN, is, uh, is uh, available to chat with us a little bit today about uh, managing the student-supervisor relationship um, a little bit further within this context. Uh, it's a, I understand it's a very casual, very informal discussion right now uh, about the challenges um, between students and supervisors and uh, how to overcome them, and how to prevent them in the first place. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Jakta. <laughs> thanks, 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 Lenin. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for inviting me for this session. Um, uh, when I was invited, I was thinking, what, how do you address this? Because uh, I think each of the things that are listed, uh, they, they, they need a day <laughs> to go through them. But I had to kind of uh, make it, as, think of it as much more practical for, for, for everyone so that at least this is not about exams. Uh, for now, you don't need to write exams on this. So, <laughs> I think it is as as, as Lenin has um, emphasized that this is more of a um, a relaxed uh, learning environment. It's 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 for equipping everyone such that uh, going forward, we are able to to go through the process or the program uh, successfully and. Uh, while still in it, we enjoy it as well. <laughs> so that is very important that we enjoy the pro the, the program because that's where you learn most. It's about uh, the skills that you acquire, about the yeah, for sure relationships will come through and all that. But the skills that you acquire must help you even beyond the program. Uh, some of us will like it to have could I say good supervisors or supervisors who we deal with, which we could uh, uh, in a sense understand and talk the same language. But some people usually don't have that. It's not easy. Uh, it could be personalities or just the understanding of the context that we we, we work in. Um, I think at the start, let me just say the university is structured in a way that there is a big university, UKZN, if you are in UKZN, and then you'll find different colleges. The college you are in is College of Health Sciences. Within that college, there are schools. Within the schools, you'll find different disciplines. Each discipline is, is, is organized such that at least within the discipline, you have people who have a common context of the work they are working in. So that that on itself, if you come in as a student, that means you belong to a certain discipline. And there are peers in, in terms of uh, other students, there are peers um, or uh, also colleagues in terms of staff who in a sense 
are familiar with that topic or that context you work in in your PhD. That is important because if you need support that have been talked about, the first contact is usually within the discipline. Uh, those are people when you, if you are like me, from environmental health, if I talk air pollution, <laughs> I know people who will understand that they will come from my discipline. On the other hand, um, and, and also within the discipline, there is a structure and that structure is you have the staff who supervise students and above that staff, there is a head of discipline. That head of discipline, everyone in that discipline accounts to that head of discipline. I, I'm making this uh, <laughs> clear because Generally, if there is an issue between a student and a supervisor, that is where first it should be handled. And if not, uh, then it could be escalated uh, further to the school. Uh, having said that, uh, to move away from that structure, the key thing, I think, as we usually use the word students, and the first thing that comes to mind is a, the high school learner <laughs> sometimes, which is not really true in the context of a, of a university or a tertiary institution, because we all adult learners, and an adult and a child, the difference is that an adult has got a responsibility, and they have to make their own decisions on lots of things so when you come when we come to the university we make a decision that okay now i want to engage on my phd it's not made by my by parents or the next person generally it's you take that responsibility if you take that responsibility that means even the supervisor you pick you have to be very conscious of uh, the dynamics that would come through from that person. And with when you work with that person, uh, I, I know myself. I've I've been when I was doing my PhD, uh, there had been uh, people who were suggested to be my mentors, who are very successful in terms of research. But I would look and say, ah, that personality, no, <laughs> don't work for me. Uh, again, it, I think it's, it, 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 maybe I was lucky because I could understand that even today, uh, I, I must say, I, I don't work with everyone. Not, not because I don't want to, but there are some, some, some ways that other people work uh, like uh, that, I think uh, it, it won't work for me. Uh, it goes back to thinking your your peace of mind is also important. <laughs> your, your, your emotional status is important uh, in all this. I'm not saying that whoever I work with, everything goes smooth. No, <laughs> doesn't. We, we, we go back and forth and... Uh, but we, we have to, 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 to make it work. Uh, when you are at the start, it's, it's a bit different uh, than when you are in the middle of it and when you are at the tail end, because the process you might have gained some life skills or some skills such that what you would not stand <laughs> At the, at the start, maybe at the end, it becomes easy to handle. And, uh, I see a hand. Mm, not sure what I... Oh, it, it, it's my hand. Um, I, yes, I'm yes. just, it's, what you're saying is really resonating with me. Um, the, the acknowledging differences in personalities, um, either as you as a stu student and, and, and your, your supervisor, um, picking that up 
to begin with, knowing that this is not actually something that's going to cause you to give the best of yourself, um, it also requires this, this, um, this understanding of yourself, knowing who you are, knowing what triggers you well enough to realize, hold on, <laughs> I can't deal with somebody <laughs> with this sort of personality, or um, I, it will make me uncomfortable and I won't produce well if I'm in this setting. So it's, um, I think I, I, I see you, I feel you as a student, that was me as well. Um, and I wish I'd known myself a little bit better. But you know, online, there are many opportunities for you to, to know yourself a little bit better. Um, you've got free personality tests. Uh, the student support services team will be able to help you as well. Um, and you mentioned very nicely the, the structure of the school, who to go to, where things do get a little bit tricky with your, your supervisor. Um, but you know, with the in the the schools, the MOU I found was also very important. Um, it's, I understand it's not a legally binding document, but um, it was useful to be able to get people on the same playing field if they're both reading the same document and understanding what is expected of them. Um, but sometimes uh, students and supervisors don't have that discussion. Um, how do we get around that? Yes, yes, uh, that, that that's the. Uh, I, I think as supervisors, uh, I'm talking from the point of supervisors. Uh, unfortunately, for students, you cannot ask a question about something you don't know. You never heard of. <laughs> But that's the reality is if you never heard of a MOU between a student and a supervisor, you won't inquire about it until you hear about it. If that is not introduced to you, you will just think that, okay, the verbal talk that you talk about, uh, it's, it's okay. But uh, as, a, as schools, we try to, we, we orientate students on these issues. Um, one of them is the MOU that needs to be uh, put up front uh, when the students join the the the, the, the institution. Um, I was um, uh, uh, there are responsibilities that uh, that are, are are for that the student must. Uh, I, I was going to say this. <laughs> Uh, as well, <laughs> so the, this is the the O M U the M O U is a, is a, I I hope the students are familiar with this document as you can see here. If you look, there are responsibilities of a supervisor. There are responsibilities of his, of the student. And uh, generally, we must be familiar with this document. One, it gives structure to the work relationship between the supervisor and the student. Um, I'll make just one one example. If whenever uh, the supervisor comment on the document, the supervisor needs to 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 return the or when when the student make a, a revisions on a document and send to the supervisor. At least there must be a timeline on when to expect a, a response from the supervisor. Uh, supervisors will always say, hey, I'm very busy, hey, I've got other students. <laughs> it, it's part of being a supervisor, you must have other students. But the timelines or the agreement between the two of you uh, must not be compromised because there are other students. And also the responsibility of a student, if you're supposed to make uh, um, revisions on a document and send it to the supervisor, if you cannot make it, you must make that call and say, look, I, I have a difficulty here. Uh, and can I can you guide me here such that uh, I make it in time? If I, I cannot make the time to to, to return the document, then 
uh, this is what because that, that that's also where it starts if you just uh, uh, keep quiet while you were, uh, were expected to send a document through the supervisor would think that this one is just a, a lazy person who doesn't do the work but maybe you have some real uh, issues with you maybe you don't understand even the the, the the issues that are raised by the supervisor but if you don't approach the supervisor and tell the supervisor look this comment i don't understand and i've been trying to 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 work on it and i can you must do you must take such initiatives yeah I, I, yes yes so so I, the, the, this document is really important because it, it gives a structure to the, that work relationship. And, and, uh, and another thing is also where the issue of, of bullying and, and harassment would be avoided. If both parties go through this document and we understand what is expected of uh, of each other, um, it's it's a so point for me in the position that I sit in as an academic leader when a student say, um, "I'll send a document to the supervisor." Now it's been six months, and I keep reminding the supervisor, but there's no response, and that usually comes after six months. <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, okay, go on. Then. Oh, that, that's terrible. Um, you know, Dr. Chakta, in the interest of time, uh, we do have some questions by uh, students uh, for you in the chat. Um, mm. so perhaps we could go through them quite quickly. Um, one from Tabaleng says, uh, we don't pick supervisors at master's level. Um, and and why, why is that? Um, a supervisor one is supposed to to be to be to 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 have a depth in the contents of 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 whatever you want to study. So I, I won't give a, a a good supervision if you were to tell me on a and then and let me supervise someone who is doing a molecular work. I would I would be lost <laughs> because I'm an epidemiologist and you need someone who's got that context. So with masters, that's why sometimes you get directed to a particular person. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, someone who's got your the, the 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 who's in your field or the field of your interest, maybe they are already kind of I say fully booked. So <laughs> you cannot they cannot take anyone else. So you get directed to the next person. Okay. Yeah. But but one thing, just that sorry, sorry, just one thing uh, to 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 note. I know students usually your the the PhD or your master's is your work. It's not a supervisor's work. So in a sense, you should be much more knowledgeable than the supervisor. The, the detail of it should be with you. Uh, the, the recent paper on, on that subject, you should be the one who knows better than the supervisor what is happening in the field when you talk to that. If it's not that, that means you are not doing your work, <laughs> to be simple. You, you should be ahead of your supervisor. The supervisor may know the bigger picture, but the details of it, you should be the 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 expect because the supervisor is there to support you and then make the the the, the journey much better and guide you in the general principles but not to 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 know the detail of what is the average height of south africans they are not into that you should know if it's your you your will way. become the, the expert by yeah. the end of the year <laughs> yes yeah. The last question is, um, where does one submit the intent to submit form? Is it done by the supervisor or the student? Do you submit via email or do you go to the postgrad office? Or oh, it's uh, sent to the postgraduate office, but the postgraduate office will send it to the, the student must send the intent 
which has been signed off by the supervisor, mm -hmm. but it's a student who sends it to the postgraduate office. Yeah. And then the postgraduate office will alert the supervisor that this has happened, and the supervisor will then send through um, the, re the reviewers, uh, recommended reviewers mm -hmm. for the for the thesis. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. I know we we ran out of time. I'm so sorry mm -hmm. uh, to the participants and to you, Dr. Jafter. But thank you so much for being here, and thank you, participants, for sticking around um, for an hour and a half of very important content. Um, the uh, Dr. Jack raised very important um, uh, messages about communication between the student and the supervisor, making sure that everybody understands what is expected of them, knowing where to go when uh, there are issues or a, a break in uh, communication or within the re relationship uh, that is important as well. And the student support services team also highlighted quite nicely um, you know, the, the methods that you can put into place, strategies to put into place uh, to, to prevent being overwhelmed by triggers such as a relationship breakdown with uh, a supervisor, if that uh, be the case. Um, thank you very much to our speakers uh, and to all our participants within the session. Apologies for the, the extended five minutes. It was, I think, very, very well worth it. And we look forward to seeing you at our next session in uh, September uh, the 5th at 3 p.m., where we will be discussing the uh, imposter phenomenon and how that impact impacts uh, your journey as well. Um, thank you. Thank you for your participation, uh, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.